I, today, am going to be building out a feature. I'll show you what the feature is, and you can build it with me. Open up the cool chat, you all can chat with me. And I hope this is a good example of building a specific thing in a real production code base. Like, there's a lot of tutorials I put out, like, oh, here's how to do a specific little JavaScript tip. But at least I've never done, and I don't see many times of like, hey, I'm doing something that is maybe not the most glamorous. I'm implementing something in a real production code base where I need to go between multiple repos and connect things together and build something actual, like real. <laughs> something that will be shipped. Uh, in fact, it's going to be shipped as early as today. Now, we won't necessarily let users use it today, but we'll see. Let me show you what I'm going to do. And this is literally just something that I have to do today. <laughs> so I figured I'm just going to stream it because I, I personally find that tips are cool, tutorials are cool, but what is it actually like to build something in a day-to-day -day environment? There's a lot of different little nuances. There's not a lot of little pieces that aren't glamorous. And more important than anything, I think in most cases, when people are imagining how other developers build things, they imagine they're using the coolest tools, the best practices, all the best things. And the reality is a little bit different than that. And I hope this is a good example of what the reality of day-to-day -day development is. So let me show you what I need to do. So here at Builder, we have this Figma plugin. Um, I'm using a secret screen here. And this plugin can take your designs and export them to responsive code of a bunch of frameworks. It can also do a couple other cool AI things. But what I need to do is I need to add a login button. To date, our Figma plugin, um, ha <laughs> ha, dev asking for one my own auth. I'm, well, I'm not rolling my own auth, but I, I um, kind of am, <laughs> we'll see. So we have our own actual auth system. So if you go into the builder application, we have our own auth. It is definitely not me rolling my own auth. I do not uh, argue anybody should roll their own auth use in our case you know we've been around for a little while we use firebase auth which which also goes on to be basically google cloud identity um so that's one cool thing just a brief rant firebase love it or hate it, it has one huge advantage which is you can build on firebase very easy firebase auth is so easy to set up just like um auth zero clerk etc obviously they're all different in their own ways too but when you need to upgrade and suddenly like for us, we needed to use big enterprise features that big enterprise clients, you can gradually transition to the full on Google Cloud suite, Google Cloud identity. And it's like actually shockingly seamless. Um, and so we have our web app here. Um, this is actually the builder space. This is how we manage our own content for our own site and apps and stuff. Um, and what I wanna do is to add a login button in the Figma plugin. What I don't wanna do is actually have a login that is uh, redundant of the login of the application. What I actually want this button to be is more of an API consumer. So as an example, we have these dev tools that you can use to connect to your code base and you can authenticate through a way many CLIs do, which is you launch into a web application. Um, you then ask for the user to authorize, yes, I want to connect my account to this CLI tool or whatever it is and then you pass a key back and that key gives access to the necessary read and write permissions um, that are needed and a way to revoke it and everything too. So Builder luckily uh, as a uh, content management platform already has this whole um, system for private keys and exchanging keys and, and authorizing. So we're gonna use that. So literally I'm gonna add a login button. I've got my React code here. <laughs> this is where I'm starting. Uh, you'll see the first ugly thing I'm doing um, yes, the session will be recorded. I, I hope people can look back at this and say, hey, you just watched some person build some feature in a real life code base. You know, what is the day to day of uh, at least me just acting as a developer because I just really want to get something done. Um, what does that look like? What does it entail? And how do I go about it? Um, keep in mind that I didn't write all of this code. In fact, I'm going to have to remind myself how our whole CLI auth flow and our key exchange flow works. Um, and I'm just gonna have to look at the code and figure that out because uh, as you'd imagine, not every single company documents every single thing they do. There's not deep documentation of everything that exists. There's not deep testing of every single thing. There's a balance. And some of the stuff we're gonna have to look at the code and figure out how it works. I'm probably gonna use um, ChatGPT for some. Uh, oh yeah, I use Omizish. Heck yes. If anybody doesn't use Omizish, I highly recommend you do. Uh, that's probably the first thing I set up in every single repo that I use. Anyway, you all, I think, can see the chat here, at least a part of it. In fact, I can move my head. Well, I can move it a bit, and you'll see a little bit more. Anyway, um, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's actually build something. 
So again, I've got this React component with nothing in it. Now, one other thing you'll notice too is that I'm using inline styling for styling. Uh, funny enough, you know how I started the stream talking about, you know, hey, when you're building real stuff in real software, you're not always using the best, latest, greatest stuff. Um, you're using whatever the repo already uses. And in the case of this repo, because you know we're a normal business, we've been around for a while, we just use inline styling. Now, that may sound like, oh no, don't do that, but it's a Figma plugin, it's not responsive. It is literally, the plugin is always this size. So we're styling things in a way that don't need to respond to different screen sizes. It's basically the smallest size all the time. One day we'll probably refactor this to Tailwind or Emotion, but the reality is, as we all know, don't make things more complicated than they need to be do the simplest approach possible. And sometimes if you don't need a styling library, you don't need to use one. So here we've got our beautiful thing. Now let's talk about what we need to do. If I remember right, if we go over to, so I've got a Figma plugin repo and I've got the builder internal repo. Um, and then over in here, so I've got my dev server running, I've got my API, my dev server running. We have this thing called the CLI auth page. And so this is a page. In fact, let's see what happens when I just go to it. Build.io, let me actually go incognito because I might have a login redirect. Um, and actually here's the first question. I don't even remember what the URL is. Now this is a create React app app. Uh, this is not your latest, greatest remix quick or, or something like that. So um, what I'm gonna do, and if I remember right, the URL is something like CLI auth. I'm gonna search inside the app, uh, or app uh, directory. And so there we go, okay. So we've got a route for CLI auth that goes to the CLI auth page, perfect. So let's see what happens if I just go build IO CLI auth. Okay, oh yeah, people just joining. So what are we building? We're building a feature. Uh, so builders Figma plugin right now has no login. So you use the Figma plugin, you can export designs to code and stuff like that. But we're building a really cool new feature where you can actually, when you export your designs to code, they can actually use your code components. So it's not just outputting Tailwind with divs and spans and H1s. It's actually going to, if your design, let's actually pull up a design. I think I have some, uh, let's see, some builder, here we go. So if I've got this design, the reality is these designs are probably made with Figma components and those Figma components need to map to uh, components of the code base. So here's a simple example. Here's a landing page design. And in this design, it's all in Figma. And this is a button component. And when we export that to code, we don't wanna have divs and spans and stuff like that. We wanna actually use our own button component with the button props that we would use in code. And so the way we're building out this feature is you can connect, uh, we basically run a tool that can look at the React components or whatever framework you use in your code. It can look at the Figma components and then we can use AI to understand like, oh, okay, the Figma button ties to this React button in this file. The hero ties to this. We can let the user change the configuration. And then when they hit, when they go into the production um, builder plugin and they hit generate code, what it'll do is it'll bounce you out to builder. It'll show you the whole response of everything we did and all the components from Figma will become components in the code export of your code base, your material UI button or your custom button or whatever, hero cards, all that stuff. And so I'll show you here in a minute what we need as a sub piece of that feature is we need the ability to authenticate. We need to be able to save information. I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. So here we go. Here's the standard way. This is before the feature we're adding or we're adding a small piece of this feature. So here we've got, cool. We've got this nice and responsive now. That's awesome. Um, but in the current way, this is just a span, right? We want that, and if we use the quality code generation, let's actually, let's do this one better and let's use quality code gen. Well, now it's a little bit better. It's using better semantic tags. It will probably use, yeah. So now it's properly, I don't know if y'all can see this on the screen. Now it's properly using an anchor for these buttons. So that's good, that's a huge improvement. But again, we don't want just a plain anchor with full on tailwind styling everything. We have a button component, we want to use it. So. Uh, and again, we're not gonna build the whole thing right now. We're gonna build a piece of it because obviously the day-to-day -day life of a developer is not building a glamorous feature every hour. It's building a piece of a feature and a necessary critical piece of a feature. And so in this case, what we have is if you go to a design system you have, um, we have this new tab. I'll go over here. Uh, this is work in progress. This will be announced and launched hopefully in the next couple of months where, here we go. We have this new components tab that's hidden and this 
will be user configurable on how the Figma component maps to your React or whatever component, but also AI will essentially suggest this is all the mappings we think are correct and you can modify. Now that's all great, but all of the configuration, every time you say, hey, this button because the component code and all this other stuff, um, that needs to be saved somewhere. And this is the part that leads into what we're building and why. When we do all this configuration, so let's say, hey, this maps to our button link component. Um, I know this because I have our, our dev tools running. Um, and also if there's props, there's prop mapping, which could be automatic, customized, or even write code to, to change how the behavior is. Um, but as I'm setting this configuration, it needs to be saved somewhere. And something we learned is that Figma plugins, if, you haven't, if you're not familiar, um, let's go to Figma plugins API. Very, very powerful, very cool system that they built, but naturally some limitation. And one of the limitations we ran across is if you wanna save data. In fact, let me show you how I develop on Figma plugins. I, these days, don't hardly ever go to documentation at all. And I know we all joke about it. Oh, you could spend hours banging your head against the wall or 10 minutes reading docs. The reality is it's not 10 minutes reading docs. I don't even know where to start. Here's big Figma's plugin docs. And I need to remind myself how you can save data in Figma plugins. And I have personally found that searching up and down this, do like save, uh, save version history, async, uh, no, this is it, uh, data, uh, data types, as. Uh, I don't know. Oh, there's there's plugin data and share plugin data, and I don't know what the difference is. And is this persistent? I don't know. I don't deal with any of that these days. I just go over to ChatGPT and I just say, hey, <laughs> I need to save data, uh, or say like I am building a Figma plugin, and I need to save uh, s data inside the plugin. What are my options? And so what we found, and ChatGPT will remind us, is there is no perfect solution for what we want. So there is client storage. <laughs> yeah, people online are saying they do this too. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah, Vuetify. Yeah, totally. What is Vuetify Figma? Hold on. Vuetify Figma? Or Vuetify you're talking about syncing Vuetify. Oh, the view component. Effect. Yeah, exactly. So the idea of this feature actually, I mean, this is this is a really common need. The idea of this feature we're working on is the fact that your designs and your code components should be able to map from one to the other. And as you already saw, we have this powerful AI that could turn these designs into responsive code. You could change between lots of frameworks. You can make it use semantic tags. We can use quick and CSS and you know use the quality code gen for high quality tag names. All awesome stuff, but not entirely useful until you realize that you actually have, you use Vuetify components, material UI components, custom components. The whole idea of a tool, a design to code tool is to help you with code that is exactly as you would have written it. And we need to use components for that. We don't just write everything as divs and spans and h1s. And so anyway, that's sort of the whole idea here. So for ChatGPT, we said, hey, Figma, how can I store data? And we can go into this. So the client storage API allows to store persistent data for each user. So this is user specific. So that's not a fit for us because as you'd imagine, when we go in and configure how this button, you know, and these are one-time configurations, by the way, the, the idea is, and Builder actually doesn't yet use a robust design system, but or, you know, our customers do. Um, the idea is you'd actually go to the design system spec where you have all the component definitions in Figma. And that's where you configure how they map to your components. Now, any once that's set one time, you do it one time across your whole organization, then when anybody exports the design, it's going to use the MUI components and other things in the code output. You copy paste your code base and done. You know, maybe light cleanup and then done. Um, now the problem though is first, this client storage API for Figma is not a fit because that's per user and this needs to be shared across users. Next we have plugin data, but also the plugin data, if I recall correctly, it saves to a document or node within the document. That's also a problem. We need data saved across documents. We need to be able to set metadata about how components map and, and use AI to generate that. And that design system file or project will be um, a separate project from when you're creating your designs, right? Most companies have a design system totally separate and they'll use the libraries. So they will go and they'll use, I think and go to assets. Here we go. So here's our builder design libraries. Here's some of the components we have. And yeah, here's our button CTA. 
And now this came from a different file, but we inserted it into a, a new Figma project or file. I, for, I forget their terminology. Um, I'm a little old school. I'm used to Adobe where you have your Photoshop files and you know, Figma's cloud base has got projects or whatever. Anyway, you get the idea. So we need some type of storage for you to set your settings and everybody in the organization use it across different files and projects. So that's where, funny enough, ChatGPT says, well, you can use an external database. And that's actually the reality here. Also, um, local storage session storage, if I remember right, does not work as expected in uh, Figma's plugin system because it's all um, transient. Is that the word I'm looking for? Everything gets thrown away in between um, um, times you invoke the plugin. And again, it's not shared. Local storage session storage is unique to, even if it does work, um, it's, it's unique to the individual we need shared. File system API, we don't want to write files. Again, it's cloud-based, we want to shared. And so again, we need to be able to save data. So, so what we've come to the conclusion of is when you configure how buttons map and stuff like that, um, that needs to be saved in a database. Well, how do you save securely in a database? Well, you need to let people authenticate, right? We're not going to just create an API where we can write data that is visible to everyone. We need to be allow people to uh, authenticate with their builder account or space. Um, and then we can save a token and that token or that key will allow read and write access to that space. So the idea is if you are um, Zapier and you want to use this feature, everyone Zapier who's already using Builder, which they do, they can log in. And that's what we're going to implement now, the login button. They can log in. Uh, they will bounce to Builder to authenticate and then be back. And now we're connected securely to their accounts. They can read and write their data and have this shared data for these nice advanced code exports from designs using their components. And anytime someone updates the configuration, it affects everybody. And so thank you, ChatGPT. Now, obviously ChatGPT could walk me through how to do this, but let's do it ourselves. So again, first thing we're gonna do, let's kind of pseudocode this. What do we want to do? What we want to do is when you click this, we're gonna to wanna to launch Builder, um, the web application. So we're actually, we're gonna use an old school API. We're gonna say window.open and builder.io slash CLI auth. And there's some parameters we're gonna need. And I forget which what they are. Uh, and so that's, again, that's a lot of what normal coding in a, in a normal job looks like, is like, remind myself how the heck this, this page works, a CLI auth flow. I could go to the CLI code and look at the auth, or I can look at the coded web app that processes the request. I'm actually gonna do that one because I'm more familiar with that and I already have it open. But the idea is we're going to say const opener. We're gonna use an old school API here. I forget, I feel like browsers are gonna deprecate this or have deprecated it or something, um, but we're gonna use this until we can't anymore. That's another way I approach most programming problems is I try very hard to not overthink it and say, hey, let me get something working end to end. This is not gonna be code we deployed to production yet, so there might be security holes. We'll plug those, we'll, we'll look into that and we'll plug those separately. Um, it might not be perfectly implemented across browsers. Um, it might have other issues. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get one basic path working. I know one path I think should work and we're gonna get it working and we're gonna see, okay, what are the pros and cons? Does it work as expected? Does it have any bugs or issues? Does it have any security vulnerabilities? You know, We're gonna get something working, we're gonna assess it, and we're gonna refine. That's another big thing. Yeah, Patrick calls it good enough code. In my opinion, almost always start with good enough code. There are rare exceptions to this, but start with like, it's kind of like molding in clay. I was watching a video the other day of how somebody molded a Godzilla out of clay. And um, it's very, very similar process of like, you know, molding clay is interesting because you start with very rough forms and you start adding the details over top of that. And it's good because, you know, let's say you're, you're new to it. And I feel like every day I'm new to programming because every day I'm programming something new. I'm using new technologies. I'm using a, a methodology workflow I haven't used. And if you don't feel like you're constantly new to programming, you're probably not learning enough because you're doing things you know and you're going to get bored and you're not going to actually learn anything. Um, and also, I agree with Patrick J.S. Godzilla Minus One is phenomenal. If you have not seen the Godzilla Minus One movie, it is amazing. And I'm really glad nobody told me beforehand that it was subtitled because I usually don't watch um, subtitled movies. So it's a, it's a Japanese movie with English subtitles. And normally I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do that. And I'm so glad I saw it because it was freaking cool. Anyway, so this is going to be our good enough programming. Let's get the model working and let's see if it falls apart in our hands. That's another big piece here too is we're going to try this approach. And if it just totally falls apart in our hands. We're going to say, hey, I'm glad I didn't overthink it or over-architect it in advance because the whole approach is flawed and we try a new one after that. So the first idea is we're going to open the CLI off. Now I think 
what's going to happen here. Uh, first, I want to see what happens. What happens when I even open this? CLI auth. Error. Okay. Why is it error? Because we're missing parameters. Why does it not have a better error message? Because we're all human and we design how we should use this. And in many cases in Build or in our company, we um, all of our developers are relatively full stack, as in they will make the back end, they will make the front ends, they'll hook it all up. It's not like I've experienced in my old um, uh, work I've done in the past where you have different teams because that's a nightmare. It's such a nightmare when you're responsible for, each, for a feature, but there's a back end piece. And no, you're a front end dev, not a back end dev. So you have to wait on the back end devs and they have other priorities and they have to get to it. Ugh, I hate it. Let's just have people build things end to end as much as we can, as much as is realistic. And so here, this is our starting point. So we're kind of doing the right things. We're on the right page. And I think we're missing some parameters. We actually have to pass in who are we are, what are we asking for, all that stuff. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to go over to a, a different repo. So this is the builder internal repo. This is where we've got the application code. And over here is our Figma plugin repo where we've got the plugin UI code. These are separate repos. We use mono repos to a certain extent. Like if we go in here, we can look at our packages. Um, there we go. So we've got separate packages. We've got the main internal mono repo, the big all React app, uh, Chrome extension, um, all kinds of other stuff. I don't even know what some of this stuff is. You know, <laughs> we got a team of a whole lot more developers than me, so they're always doing stuff. Um, API, a bulk of the code is in our app and then followed by the APIs. Anyway, inside of the application code is we have this CLI auth. And here we can see at the top of this component, because this is a, a, a stateless component in the sense that you load up this page, um, it's going to process what you're asking and it's gonna give you just an authorization button. And when you hit it, it's gonna destroy the page. It's gonna either redirect or send a message and close itself, something like that. So funny enough, you're gonna see something very unusual here. You're gonna see React code that's straight up looking up search parameters. It's not in a use effect. It's not in um, some other type of, of beautiful structure. It's literally just on startup looking at this stuff. And on re-render, it'll regather it. Is that perfect and the best way to implement this? Uh, this is a trade-off. Is it simple? Yeah, it's very, very, very simple. And so let's go in here and it's looking for a host. Now we'll look down below to see if these things are even used. Client ID, a framework. I think framework sounds like it's more specific to the CLI um, use case than in our case, we want to adapt this to a Figma plugin use case. Um, response code, okay. And for some reason, we would load this with a success already too. Okay. So one thing it looks like is we have a redirect URL and a preview URL. I think I know what the preview URL is. Now going down, one thing I know, let's first start looking at what our error is. Let's see exactly where we're, we're bugging out here. So I'm gonna go to the console and I'm not seeing anything. Let's hit a refresh. Um, actually, let's also go to my localhost. Localhost 154 is where I'm gonna develop on this. If I don't see anything interesting, also you notice localhost has got some other error messages. It's a little bit noisy in, in local development. Um, I'm not seeing, let's see what causes this error screen. So here an error, response code not equal code. Okay, or not host or not client ID, okay. There we go. So it we need a host and client ID. Let's hack our way through to get this working. Even if we're not using the right values, I think by seeing it come together, and then we can make sure we're placing the right values. We'll, we'll get there kind of big piece at a time. And again, you'll notice something that I mentioned before. I'm not gonna overthink or over architect this. I'm not gonna spend hours studying how this code works. I'm gonna start supplying some values and I'm gonna start kind of tinkering here to see if I understand how this works through kind of real world trial and error here. It's not everybody's coding style. It is definitely mine. It's definitely one I recommend. And to be frank, it's the, the most, some of the best engineers I've ever worked with or hired can just jump into any code base and just figure it out. And how do they do that? Well, as you imagine, they don't study everything because it's impossible to study everything. They start hacking their way through and trial and erroring until they get their, their bounds. It's kind of like when you're a child and you're learning how the world works and you're touching stuff and you're hitting your head and stuff. We're going to be doing that here. And so let's go up to, okay, so we need a host. And I don't even know how host is used. So let's search through this for host. Okay, we've got a key. How is host used here? Mm, let's actually, host is, as a word is used a lot. So let's switch to, I'm gonna use find all references. Great. So interestingly, it's not really used. It's used to create a key. 
Where's that key used? What is this even for? Can I just say foobar for host? I might do that for the very beginning. Get private key, key. Let's get private key doing. I see. Okay, so this is finding, yep. This is finding, um, so we save in the database these different private keys. This is able to look up a private key. And uh, it looks like we're just, I see. I think this has been an evolution over time where this originally was a use case for plugins, then it became part of our CLIs. And so for now, I'm gonna supply the host as Figma. I think that's gonna be pretty close to what we want and we will refine this later. So let's go back over here and let's say host equals, and I think I need a formatted URL. Uh, maybe I don't. Okay, host equals, you say figma.com. So this is coming from Figma or the Figma plugin. Now let's let's see what happens. We're already here. I'm just gonna actually simulate this. Hoax equals figma.com. We should still get an error because we're missing another param. Let's see. Okay. And so still error. That was expected though. If I go back to the not host, okay, not client ID. So what is client ID and how is it used? Find all references, client ID. Okay, so we're tracking this. We're keeping track of this um, for our own instrumentation analytics. We're checking it here. Where are we using it? Ah, so client ID is just a string representing what we will print in this message saying who is asking for this. So I'm gonna say the client ID here, uh, just for testing purposes, I'm gonna say Figma plugin, Figma plugin but I think I'll change it to be more readable in a moment. We'll either get the error one last time or we'll be further. Okay, so we're making progress, I think, and hope. So not client ID, not host, and response code, not equal code. Now what in the world is response not equal code? Apparently we want response type equals code. Let's try, again, we're trial and error. What I want to see is a message. Okay, I'm still not getting what I want, so let's do some logging. Let's see, response code not equal code. That's what I did, right? Response type equals code and response code equals params response type. Client ID, oh, that's my problem. Client ID. It needs to be snake case instead of camel case. There we go, okay. So this is where we wanna see. So this is good. We just saved ourselves a lot of time. Now, in an ideal world, this would be documented somewhere. Totally, absolutely. But this is life, not everything's documented. Internal code is not always fully documented. So this is the uh, the format we need this request in. So I can move this to my plugin code and we can use it. So I want, I'm gonna use my local host for now. I will replace this later and maybe I'll use a, a variable. In fact, yeah, let's do one thing. Uh, const host equals use dev. I'll explain this in a moment, then We'll copilot figure it out. A hey, almost. No, not A. Okay. We have this use dev flag that just lets us know if we're developing locally. So now we're going to use host. I can make a pretty um I have a really cool VS Code extension, by the way. I forget what it's called. Maybe somebody knows in the chat, point it out. But anytime I'm in a normal string, let's say I'm taking this string and I type dollar open squiggle, it converts it to a template string with a back tick. Pretty life-changing in my opinion. It's actually pretty buggy. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple ways to break it. It's pretty easy to break. So if I have like const foo equals, um, hello, uh, what's an example? It's time for coding. And then I do this. Uh, it, it, oh, it didn't work at all. Well, I know that there's an issue. Yeah, okay. This thing is pretty easy to break. Maybe if I do a space, whatever. I know another thing that breaks where if you have uh, a, an apostrophe or paren inside of your string, it kind of like looks back and it's like, oh, this is a single quote string. Anyway, but for the basic cases, it's very, very simple. Yeah, what is the name of this extension? Hold on, let me find this for you. Um, what I have installed. I got a lot of stuff installed. I learned about this on TikTok, by the way, the VS Code count on TikTok. What is this? Template string converter. There it is. Template string converter. It's got almost, well, it doesn't have a lot of reviews. It does have a lot of users, 40K users. This thing is cool. Doesn't work perfectly all the time. 90% of the time works great. Either way, you're probably saving time. 
So anyway, this is the format that we want. And let's start pulling some things out to local variables. Again, some of these things should probably be configs and shared and whatever. We're going to start very simple. I don't have to think about how this stuff is reused across the app. I'm just going to use it right now. So I'm going to say uh, host equals figma.com and const client ID equals figma plugin. Uh, I think what I actually want here is builder.io figma plugin and const response type equals code. Now here's the next trick. Here's where we actually get into real cool tricks. Um, as you know, day-to-day -day programming is not always using the latest, greatest, coolest APIs. Um, <laughs> Patrick said 90% of the time it works every time. Anchorman joke, this is a good one. Um, anyway, so this is where, again, we're taking these incrementally and we're refactoring only as needed. Notice one thing already. I already have a blog post and video out on how you should always use new URL instead of uh, strings, const URL equals, um, you know, guy strings. But as you can see, I already broke my own rule. And that's something that I really want to actually reinforce here. I have put out content before where I'm like, hey, here's some code. And people are like, oh, you didn't do this thing. And that's the, this is the better thing. Honestly, all this stuff is relative. So in my opinion, should I have started with new URL for this if I had builder.io? Should I have used new URL for this? No, that's excessive. That doesn't make any sense. It's not dynamic, there's no need, who cares? And when I'm just adding one thing, a host, where at least I know from my own code, the host is URL safe. A host is, is it should always be URL safe. I, you wouldn't put space in a host, that's fine. But now I'll give you a brief example. Now I can start adding um, template interpolations for everything. So I can go in here, host, and I can go in here, client ID is, client ID. And here's the big question. There's a bug in this code. Can you all spot the bug? Literally, there's a bug right now that will totally, very much might break this, but it's definitely a, a bug, if not bad practice. Do you all know what it is? Response type code, it's right in front of you. It's a nasty, nasty, anti-pattern, ugly thing. Uh, nobody in the chat's got it? Come on, there's a bug right here in front of us. I'll give you a hint. We're adding these interpolations in and nope, so not got it, but whatever. Spaces and client ID, boom, Vidal got it. Yeah, so I'm taking these strings and I'm putting in a URL string, but I'm not escaping things like spaces. You know, these, these values could also change, right? Like while I would still argue host is probably safe in the majority of cases, this, what if this would become the builder dial plugin and something, oof, that's gonna cause us major issues. That's gonna actually break stuff. So. We could come in and we can say encode your component every single time. Ugh. This is, it's like the longest, it drives me crazy that encode your component is so long. I actually think verbose names are a good thing. You know, be descriptive, be verbose. I don't even know what encode Yuri does. There've been many times in my life where I'm like, do I really need encode Yuri component or I just need encode Yuri? Encode Yuri never acts the way I expected. I've never even researched when and how and why you should use a thing. It seems like you just don't use it ever. Anyway, this is ugly code. Let's make this prettier. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna say now, so only now I'm going to use the new URL constructor. I know I've said before, yeah, I always use that. Well, the reality is use it when you have a situation like this. Always use your judgment on what makes sense. You don't need to be excessive all the time. So let's say URL equals, and we're going to say new URL, and we're going to provide the base. The base here is going to be this. So I'm going to take this out. Oops, I doubled some of these quotes. There we go. Um, and also, I'm not using a PC this time, so I do know how to use my own keyboard shortcuts finally. Vidal, are you hired? No, unfortunately, but <laughs> you definitely get extra credit. Um, so we have the base of our URL, and let's start adding our param. So this is what's beautiful about, oh my god, two things. Beautiful about the URL params API um, is you can just add these parameters one by one. You don't have to worry about encoding your component. I think this is quite nice. And uh, there we go. And the beautiful thing about GitHub Copilot is it just knew what the heck I wanted. So there we go. Let's kill all this. And let's say URL.toString. We don't always technically need the toString. Um, in most cases, the type will be coerced and, and stringified, but I think it's a safe thing to do. Now, this is looking pretty good. Now, I actually don't know why I added this redirect URI and not the, um, oh, there we go. Yeah, we actually don't need the redirect URI. It's interesting it knew we would need a redirect URI though. That is actually one of the parameters of this um, of this sort of like uh, interface we're working with. Anyway, there we go. And now let's see if this works. So now I'm gonna go to the Figma plugin. Luckily the Figma plugin hot reloads. 
I've got this new tab. Here's another thing, by the way. I'm doing something um, unusual, but in my opinion, interesting here. I have no design for this feature. I don't even know what the feature needs. One way we work at Builder is, in many cases, we just have the developer figure things out, and then we have the designer come in and figure out how it should work. So what I mean by that is, it's very, very easy. Uh, something that I've seen fail a lot, not always, but a lot, is you're like, okay, we need authentication for the plugin. First, let's our product manager spec out all the requirements for this. And I think by default, the tendency is to put too many things, is not to be oriented towards MVP and to just list every possible, you know, dream feature. I mean, not everything, but like more than is really needed. And then it goes to the design. And design kind of thinks about it. And something that drives me crazy about product design, especially if you want to be lean and iterative like, like we really strive to be, is the product designer might say, oh, well, in order to add auth, we're going to have to rethink this whole UI. Basically, like, okay, instead of tabs, we're going to have a drop down. We're going to add the auth to every single, you know, and it's like, ah, you may not need any of this stuff. Uh, the opposite way to work, which is not uncommon in, in kind of young, scrappy kind of startup companies, and I see people use in, in, in occasionally in, in other size businesses, um, is to actually say, hey, developer, probably a more senior developer, we need authentication. In, in our case, like this whole UI is basically being come up by Adam Bradley on the spot. In fact, this image, Adam Bradley, Adam Bradley's the creator of Ionic, by the way, and Stencil and other cool stuff. This image, he didn't create that. He borrowed it from this screen. <laughs> We're just putting it together. Step one in building something new and interesting, in my opinion, is just make something functional, right? Make it ugly, make it work. In making it come to life, you start realizing things it needs and things it probably doesn't need. Some things that you thought were necessary worked. When you actually use it without 10 of the features you thought were needed, it actually is simppler and easier than you expected. And sometimes there's whole other things or the whole approach was flawed in the first place. A good thing we didn't spec it and design it and all this stuff. So Adam has this whole kind of component configuration UI. He's just slapping together with components we have. We're gonna have um, a working end-to-end -end example here very soon. And then we're gonna send that to our, our product designers who are fantastic and say, hey, here's how it works. Here's what we need out of it. We're very clear on, on the basics of what is sort of needed to use this feature. And by needed, I mean like needed. Like if you wanna build simple products, you have to stick to what is necessary. And how do you know what's necessary? You don't sit and think about it. And talking to customers is a key piece, but that's not necessarily the definition either. You gotta just use the thing. So how do you optimize towards using the thing as soon as possible? You just start building, <laughs> really, like seriously. You start building the thing and then you figure out the rest later. It's gonna sound silly and it's gonna sound ridiculous, but that's really what has worked for me throughout my entire career, make an MVP. So I'll stop ranting, we've got this. So is this the best place for a login button? No, absolutely not. This is definitely not the place to put a login button. But what I wanna do is I wanna make it work first and then I'll figure out where it should go. And then I'll get our designers to help me figure out how it should look. And as y'all might know, we've got um, between 50 and 100 people at this company builder. I'm the co-founder and CEO. And uh, I still code. <laughs> I stream. <laughs> it's it's uh, It might seem wild, but actually this visual copilot 1.0 launch is really, really important. And I want to get this thing live ASAP. I also really enjoy uh, interacting with developers across the ecosystem because we build our product for developers and for teams where developers are a key component. And so I definitely want to keep close with all of you on what do you need, what are we building to meet your needs, all of that. So with all that said, we're going to hit our login button. Now, weirdly enough, nothing happened. So what did I do wrong? Oh, I know what might be going wrong. And this might already invalidate my whole hypothesis here. Okay. So I hit the button, nothing happened. We'll add some console logs if we need it. But I wanna check the console here. Oh, we've got this annoying. Uh, one thing that's gonna make our lives a little bit annoying is we have this uh, heartbeat ping to check if our dev tools are running. It's a ping to see if our local CLI is running in your project so that we can, um, we can actually communicate with it to understand the structure of your code. Because remember, we're looking at your Figma components in this plugin and we're looking at the components in your code and we're mapping to them and powering this export all the way out to your code base. So this heartbeat's gonna be really annoying, but I'm gonna click, there we go. Okay, failed to construct URL, invalid URL. Okay, cool, there's our error. So why is this invalid? We've got, oh, host. Ah, ha, ha. when I asked for bugs earlier, nobody saw this bug, okay. So we're defining a host here and we're defining host here. This here means the host param. So actually we have a host param here. I knew there was three params we wanted. And here we want the um, web application host. So let's rename this to web app host. 
and I'm gonna move that over here. We could also make this a constant, in my opinion, shouting snake case is the ugliest way to name things. We already have the const keyword. That said, it's probably appropriate here and people know what I mean. So I'm back and forth if I can, if I wanna use it, nice camel case conventional or um, full on super const. You know, they call this like the constant case. Well, we already have the constant keyword. So it's like extra super duper constant. Um, oh yeah, so uh, I have no idea how to say your name, Guilds Pro, Guilds Pro. Um, you're right. Normally what I would actually do is, um, this, I would do right click rename. Okay, F2 would have been faster, but you'll see it won't work here and I'll show you why. Yeah, see, it didn't work. The reason why is because we have the shadowed variable. So it thinks host is referring to this. And so anyway, we're gonna go back. We had to we had to do it manually this time. Oop, now I made a mess actually. Let's go back, let's just call this uh, web app host. That said though, when you are using TypeScript and now that I got rid of the shadowing problem, if I wanna rename this, yeah. I'm lame and right click and, and type RE and you know, now I can actually name it nice, nicely. I'm glad you shared F2, I should really memorize that. That's much nicer. Anyway, our URL should be good now. So let us go back over here. Uh, our Figma plugin should reload automatically. We're gonna go in here, we're gonna hit get login and still nothing happening. I might have an idea as to why. So our code should be okay. Let's try this. I'm guessing window.open is being blocked. Now window.open is typically blocked in browsers uh, besides a couple of nuanced rules. If I remember right, the rules are click had to just happen. Uh, this is for those of you who remember the internet of the late 90s and early 2000s, pop-ups were a huge problem. Pop-up windows at your face like crazy. A pop-up would open a pop-up. Next thing you know, your whole set of windows is a mess. So browsers, from what I understand, um, implemented some rules. You can't just trigger pop-ups out of nowhere. It has to be, you click on something, you get a pop-up. Now in this case, it should be that way. It should be synchronous. You click, you get a pop-up. So let's console log, console log, opening window. Um, oh yeah, Patrick remembers the old web. Uh, let's check the URL, the two string. Does the URL look okay? And are we getting an opener reference? I'm guessing we're not. And just in case there's like a silent error thrown here, I'm gonna call it a log, my good old favorite. Here, okay, let's see if we make it here. Let's see if we open the window. And if we see neither of those logs, then something happened earlier, an error got gobbled. So let's go in here, let's go component, let's go log in. Here, okay, opening window, okay, opener returns null, which I think that means we are not actually opening the pop-up. Console log debugging is the best. I agree with that, except when it's not. <laughs> it's, it is my default in almost every case. Now with Figma plugins, it's kind of your only option. Um, we've tried using the debugger in Figma plugins. They run a custom JavaScript VM. It's actually quite cool how it works. Like Figma is, uh, Figma is a cool product by the way, just so you all know. So just so you know what we're looking at here, like actually behind the hood. Um, I almost want to Excalibur draw this. Let's Excalibur draw this real quick how Figma works. Let's take this screenshot. It works in a very, very cool way. Um, uses very cool web technologies. Okay, so the Chrome, everything outside of the canvas. So this is the canvas. The canvas is, uh, let's do this and let's say, kabam. Ooh, that's ugly. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a terrible ugly color. How do I make this bright and pretty? Okay, cool. The canvas or the artboard or whatever you want to call it, this thing that I'm scrolling around. That's all made in C++. That's WebAssembly. This is all C++. This stuff around it, at least last time I kind of poked around, this was all React. So let's make this blue. React and React components. This, this, and this. Really, really cool stuff. So they do some advanced things. If you don't know uh, Figma CTO, it's quite awesome. Figma CTO, made, um, why am I blanking on it? What was originally the really fast way to transpile and bundle um, JavaScript written in Go. What is it? Okay, I gotta ask ChatGPT or I can ask uh, chat stream. What is the, <laughs> I can't remember this. What is like the fast, now if you're using Rollup or Webpack, you probably wanna use ES Build. Figma CTO made ES Build. They make a really a lot of really cool web stuff. And so, um, 
they're good with the, the make stuff fast on the browser. And apparently that was the whole thesis. Early on when WebGL came out, they were like, hey, how do we make something useful with this? They started making design tools and Figma was born out of that idea. At least that's what, you know, how, how the, the saying goes. So this is all C++ WebAssembly. Uh, I should make that clear. WebAssembly and one big canvas. Now, even though this looks like a native app, this is a web app. Uh, this is just a web app wrapped uh, using probably Electron or, or very similar, maybe something custom, probably Electron. Um, and then, yeah, we have standard React all around it. Now, what's interesting, their plugin system, um, to make a safe sandbox for plugins, this has been a long running challenge in JavaScript, which is how do I allow people to execute code on my website without my website being vulnerable uh, to... Um, security uh, attack vectors, insecure attack vectors. So let's take Builder as an example here. Here's our web application. We have a plugin system and everybody implements plugins differently. The most common way is with iframes. The idea that you can allow other people to execute code within your site as long as it's in a sandboxed iframe. Some kind of self-contained world where it can't read your window, can't read your cookies, it can't scrape your screen, all that stuff. Another approach, um, well, the, let's go to the other side. The ideal approach, for this stuff is, um, uh, it used to be called Realms or Shadow Realms. I think it still is. Um, let's go to the TC39 Shadow Realm proposal. There we go. This is still alive and thriving. Yeah. So this, if I recall correctly, I've, I've been waiting for this forever, um, is a way to safely evaluate JavaScript in the browser that is untrusted. And so that's where, oh, and WebAssembly could be an interesting solution to this as well. Um, yeah, so Shadow Realms is kind of your way that will come to the browsers one day to, to uh, execute untrusted code. Safe sandbox, can't have access to the wrong things. The other hack that exists today is you open a sandboxed iframe, you, um, you create a web worker inside of it, and you evaluate the code as a string through the web worker. The web worker itself, if you just run code untrusted in a web worker, you have the issue that it's still, if I remember right, it's still like HTTP requests um, still say that the origin or where they're coming from is the domain of the site. And we know with um, kind of security around domains and cross origin security, stuff like that, you know, a domain is meant to be trusted. You, you send a request from a domain, you should be able to trust that that is actually that domain, um, at least if it's coming from a, a genuine browser. Now, with a web worker, you will have it automatically still execute as if it's from that domain, even though it's it's in a sandbox environment. It can't access the window and other stuff. Um, but you wrap that in a sandboxed iframe, and then you get some level of security. But you don't get DOM access. You don't get a bunch of things that you need to build real applications in many cases. So anyway, the question, of course, is how does Figma solve this? Because really, all the solutions I mentioned are not that great and not good for making a really good plugin system. What Figma does, that's really cool, let's go back to Excel draw is they, uh, because you could compile any C, C++ Rust code to WebAssembly pretty straightforward, they, at least from what I understand, maybe this is what they did before and they do something new now, but they just straight up compile down a JavaScript runtime that they control and they execute your code within that. So your Figma plugin is, gener is running through a totally custom JavaScript engine, so to speak that is compiled to run in the JavaScript or the WebAssembly engine of the browser. So you have uh, JS engine inception, basically. What that means is some, now first, shockingly, it works better than you'd expect. I'll, I'll start there. But some things, some very small things don't work as is expected, like debugging. So that's why we're gonna today be debugging everything with console log. Thank you for my TED talk about why I'm using console logs. <laughs> um, does Figma use Dino for plugins when you download the native Figma uh, or all the same tech? I have no idea. Um, but, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, so let's go back over here. So, so far, we may have found that our idea of window to open is just a, a it's not going to work. Now, we can talk about some alternatives, some janky alternatives. One janky alternative is we can open up an iframe. Um, so if we wanted to, let's actually just run through uh, this. Have I heard of console group? Are we talking about, I think so, maybe? What is console group? Console group stat, what does this do again? Oh yeah, it makes like indented output. Oh wow, that's an interesting point. Um, 
that could make our lives a little easier. So it's not just like here, 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 here. That's pretty cool. Oh, I see. It's a secret thing. Group and group end. That's pretty interesting. That's a cool little trick. Thank you for sharing that. And so uh, it seems I can't open a pop-up. Actually, let's try this. Um, let's ask ChatGPT. I am writing, writing a, you know, I saw a poll recently of if people prefer to code on their own or to code um, with, um, you know, pair programming. Majority of people prefer to code on their own. I am one too. Every once in a while, I do want somebody's opinion and I don't want to wait and I want just somebody else to give their thoughts. ChatGPT is weirdly good at that. So I'm going to get ChatGPT's input here. Um, I'm writing a Figma plugin and I am trying to call window.open URL. A window doesn't seem to be opened though. Actually, I'll also add that I'm doing a uh, blank. I think as a quick test, we should probably also remove the blank. Open though, why might this be, how might I fix or work around this? Let's see what ChatGPT says. I will tell you something funny. You know how I started this with, we need to have our own external database for saving this data and use authentication. You know who came up with that idea? ChatGPT came up with that idea. <laughs> we kind of thought that might be it, but sometimes when you just see somebody outline your options and you could go one by one and say, won't work, won't work, will work, won't work, won't work, will work, then it's like, okay, we feel more confident that that is the right path. And now that we're going down this path, obviously it's a non-trivial path, we feel confident that, hey, this is the right way to go. Um, let's see. UI, oh, you can use, oh, wait. Yeah, that's right. So one interesting thing about Figma plugins is there are two JavaScript environments you have to deal with. This can get a little annoying and tedious, though it's very understandable. You've got that custom JavaScript VM. So what's interesting is we have like this code.ts. This is running the code that runs in the custom JavaScript VM. And this is where we can manipulate read and write to the Figma documents. Then you have the UI.TSX. This is where what that code will do is it'll spawn an iframe and then the iframe. So just so you know, this is an iframe. This is a normal, normal, normal iframe, sandboxed iframe probably right here. This little window of dragging has a little iframe inside of it. Um, this iframe is the standard browser JavaScript execution context, which HTML, CSS, JavaScripts, where we're loading React in here too, because I'm a masochist. Um, so from that, we have certain restrictions of what we can and can't do. And then from the VM, which is kind of hidden, there's no UI for it, um, we can actually read and write to the document. And we have to use post message to message between these two things. And so it's possible window.open will only work in one of these environments. Now, what ChatGPT says is, and I'm gonna try removing this blank real quick and just run it, see what happens. Okay, we're trial and erroring. We're just figuring it out as we go. Um, but ChatGPT says you should be able to run this in the iframe and, and it's still not working. So we have a UI at HTML where we're loading React in it. We should be able to use this. Uh, post messages is how you message back and forth. Uh, yeah, and this only works if the user interacts directly with UI HTML. That all is true. And so I will admit, I don't know why it's not launching, but we'll continue to play here. Um, we could do a redirect is display for the user to click. It can be standard. Oh, that's an interesting idea. We can just do this. I know that will work, but we will not have the opener reference, which we actually need unless we do some other workaround. Oh, look at that. There's an open URL. Okay, here's another option, Figma UI open URL. See, sorry, just so we all can see how handy ChatGPT is. It's not only understanding the docs and regurgitating just the right doc information for my question, but it's also suggesting combinations of standard HTML uh, um, development practices and the plugin, and it's quite confidence building. Now, every once in a while it makes things up. I will say with ChatGPT4, I have found that it makes things up a lot less or it hallucinates a lot less. Every once in a while, like there, there is like a 5% chance that this API doesn't exist. <laughs> it's just not a thing. Um, but, um, we can try it out. We can, if something doesn't work, you could tell it and you can revise. So this could be an interesting. Now, what we still need to, we still need to open a reference. We still need to be able to ping. And this is the hard part in this workflow is we need to be able to ping. We need to open up the URL. We need to be able to ping back um, the private key. And there's a few ways we could do this, but I do, um, God, I really like the idea of window opener, but that might not be an option. 
Um, and let's see, do I have custom instruction set up? I do not actually, but, oh, that's cool. Patrick's saying is he had some custom instructions. For all of you that don't know, funny enough, I learned about custom instructions when we were adding a similar feature into Visual Copilot. So just so you all know, when we're exporting code here, we added this feature that, I can't remember what we called it. We called it like a universal prompt or something where you can add instructions that apply to every time you output code. And um, we we're trying to figure out what to name it. And then somehow somebody mentioned like, oh, custom instructions. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, if you go to ChatGPT and you go here and here, you can add custom instructions. As in, you know, one thing I've noticed that ChatGPT can be a little bit verbose, a little wordy. I'm like, what is the code for X? And it's like, to do X, and it gives me like, a long description. I'm like, I asked for the code, not how. I know how to do it. I just want the code because I'm lazy. <laughs> and so this is where we could write in the instructions, like, don't be verbose. You know, give me just, if I ask for code, just give me code. Um, or anything else that you want it to know. Like, hey, Patrick's saying, you know, I use React. Um, I use a Mac OS. You could give it some context that you don't have to type over and over and over. It's just one time, ask your questions and it knows. Now I'm a little bit paranoid of doing that because I'm going to write something, I'm going to forget about it and I'm going to get a weird response because maybe I write that I use a Mac and then sometimes I use a window for gaming and other stuff and I'm going to forget. Um, oh, Patrick sent me his. Hell yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Where'd you send that? Discord or something? Anyway, uh, I, I might play around with that. That actually seems pretty interesting. But anyway, custom instructions, pretty powerful, pretty awesome. Um, so let's try, let's try a couple things. Figma.ui.open URL. Uh, let's actually, I do want to know more about this. So open URL. Uh, 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 uh. Here's a little note on dot open. Here's when you move on for website, you open the integration with, uh, yeah, this is sort of, we're implementing something very similar to Oloth here. However, this doesn't work with Figma plugins. The Figma plugin app is an Electron app, not a browser. Common is, is from a plugin for the Figma disk opens a new window in the browser where window operator is null. I see. So what is the solution? Your own server on the public internet and have the user authenticate your server. Yep, you can then send the access token from your server back down to Figma plugin. That's a question I want to know is how do I send it, how do I send this info back down? We're doing a very similar um, flow to OAuth. Not exactly OAuth, but some some similar ideas. Cool, 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 cool. For some effort to implement a secure way and then doing everything locally. Authentication flow. So how am I gonna message this back? This is where we're actually gonna read docs. Like all things, nothing is absolute, right? We're not gonna use ChatGPT for everything. Sometimes we're gonna read the actual docs. And uh, let's see. So how are we gonna write? UI entry point browser. Yep. Your server UI entry point. Yeah, how's this? How are we going to communicate this back? Right key, read key. Oh, I see. It's suggesting. Oh, I was hoping there'd be something easier than this. Part of me is like, maybe we should just have Firebase uh, auth right here. This is a great example, by the way. Thank goodness we didn't over architect this out because. It is very possible that my idea will not work because it seems that there's no real way to communicate um, back to the um, Figma plugin after we've opened the builder application. Now, there may be other workarounds here. I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, you got to use HTTPS. Cool, cool, cool. I think it's suggesting that we. Oof. Um, I'm skimming this, obviously. I think it's suggesting we generate some type of like token, you know, a random string or something. We then send that to a browser. Um, then from the browser, the browser is going to write some type of access token to a server. Then we're going to ping some server URL with that same token to get it. So we're basically like nothing can push an update to our Figma plugin in any capacity. We require the Fable plugin to be the one to message you and then know where to look over here, like on a server to find the values and needs. Oh, I hate that idea just because it's so much more complicated than just having a window opener. We may not have an option, but we'll see. Um, let's see. Adam has a potential idea for me. So I'm definitely open to, to hearing it, but let's see here. So Figma open URL, I think it gives no reference back. I cannot post an, an opener. Let's check this. Let's roll out all our options before we do the really complicated way. 
figma.ui.oh. Oh no, figure out open URL actually is just, I know what that is. That's just a way to um, open up like a new sort of iframe. And an iframe is actually an interesting idea. Hmm. I do have an alternative idea here, which we can open up an iframe. Let's let's play with that for a minute. So an alternative here would be to say, um, let's have an iframe, iframe source equals, um, let's add a little function here, function, Get iframe URL where you reuse this stuff, or get uh, get auth page URL. Cool. Now we're gonna go bam, 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 bam. And keep in mind, we're just hacking or slashing our way through this. We might have to refactor everything. There may be just straight up security problems with this. I could actually already foresee a couple, but we're not gonna worry about that yet. We're gonna get it working. We're gonna test the user experience. We're gonna test the functionality. We're gonna unblock ourselves, and before it goes to production, we'll make it sure it's secure and refactored. And Here's the big thing to know too. You know how I mentioned like, oh, writing long specs, I hate that, blah, blah, blah. There's one time that makes sense to write a long, elaborate, very detailed spec. And that's when we are crystal clear on our requirements. Meaning we've prototyped it, we've MVP'd it, we've tested it end to end. We thoroughly know what is possible and not and how the final solution needs to be. It probably will be the most complicated version because we were just trying to do easy wins up until we, we learn our way through. That's when it can make sense to say, okay, we have it working. We identified there's one key part of the flow that, that's vulnerable and we need to architect this right. And the good news is when you actually write that spec um, at the very end, the beauty is you've already learned what you can't do. So the risk here would be, let's say we wrote this perfect spec and let's say that perfect spec depended on window.open. We wrote this detailed spec, we handed it to somebody, they started architecting this thing all perfectly and they finally get to window.open, they finally realize, uh-oh, that don't work. And that's something that is super duper annoying and wasteful to happen. And in this case, that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to figure out where all the options and problems are, and that way we know exactly how to build the final solution. And so we're doing that first step here. So, okay, so we're gonna return the URL. Great, and I can undo all this. And I can actually pretend, oh, let's not do it. Let's just go here. And prettier is not working, so I must have some problem. Ah, here it is. So let's do get off page URL, the two string. Wonderful. Width 100%, height 500. Okay, cool. And so now I'm going to add a piece of state. Uh, const show iframe set show iframe equals use state. And we're going to start with false. So we're not going to show this just yet. We're going to wrap this in show iframe and, and there we go. Let's see in the chat. Um, yeah, iframes can work really great for payment systems, you're right. Um, cool token and URL create some temp entry in database. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, Adam, exactly what you're saying is, is I think what Figma's suggesting and I think probably the way we're gonna end up doing this. So you're right. We're gonna create some type of temporary token. We're gonna send that, we're gonna write it over and then we're gonna pull until we get it to pull it out. That's probably going to be our solution, but let's try the iframe real quick, and then otherwise we can build that. Uh, important, you're finished. Yes, yeah, I agree. I think this is our, our very clear backup plan. The good news, basically, what Adam's suggesting, which I can actually step back and maybe describe in better detail in a moment, maybe when we go to implement that, which feels likely. Um, I think that's our fallback plan. That's the guaranteed to work, and hopefully we don't have to do it because maybe this easier path will work. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be the one we do. Um, so let's try our iframe hack really quickly and go from there. So I'm gonna import use state here. Uh, the only way. Oh yeah, Caleb said they did the temp entry DB thing too. Do you do it for a Facebook plugin use case or is that for some other use case entirely? I can imagine it's a pattern you can use for many things. Um, but yeah, Andre's pointing out the thing that I'm interested in, which is the iframe can send data back to the parents. Now what's interesting about iframes is um, you know, there's a certain security um, peace of mind in opening. Oh, interesting. So Caleb, yeah, what's the uh, Figma plugin you make, Caleb? I'm curious. Um, that's good to know. So you, uh, this is actually extremely valuable just for everybody paying attention is, um, oh, by the way, people mentioning on X, the stream quality is bad. Uh, apparently the stream quality on X is bad in general and it's way better on YouTube. Uh, after I finish streaming, the video quality seems to be good on X. I think they're actual just real-time streaming kind of sucks. So you can find the same stream on LinkedIn, YouTube, um, and Twitch. I think I'm Steve878 everywhere. Let's look at what Caleb's uh, 
rendition Figma plugin. I'm just curious. This is really cool. Uh, Figma code with AI. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very, very similar use case. Awesome. This could be worth people checking out. Uh, rendition for Tailwind too. Oh, cool. You got two. Um, let's see how your website is. Oh, cool. Is that, I might be looking at the same person here. Oh, that might be somebody else. Anyway, I appreciate you sharing that. So in this case, I think we have a pretty clear backup plan. Now, the iframe thing is interesting because it might be easier and we can message an iframe in and out, but we do miss one thing. The, the one downside of an iframe in the context of security is it's really valuable to be able to see um, the actual host you're opening up to make sure it's not like phishing, for instance. Like the way you know, I'm if I open something in an iframe, um, you don't see the URL. So there is still a small risk you're getting fished. You have, it, it looks like a certain website, but it isn't actually, because you can't verify the URL. You can't verify, you know, the security that it's actually, um, you know, HTTPS and secure connection, stuff like that. Now, actually, no, I'm wrong about the HTTPS piece because um, these days, all apps and sites are going to be in HTTPS strict mode. You can't load HTTP inside of HTTPS. I remember when that first was kind of mandated by Google and that was a huge pain um, like, like this was back in the day, but back in the day, one day, everybody had to go from HTTP to HTTPS and it seemed easy. We're just going to make our domain HTTPS. Turns out, nope, <laughs> everything inside has to be HTTPS too. All scripts, all iframes, all, I think images too. I mean, every single thing at, at an early day of the web, that was actually a really complicated, painful thing to do because not everything was ported in and yada, yada, yada. Oh, we just broke something. So let's see, let's actually finish our, our iframe logic here and we're just gonna feel it out. We're gonna feel if the iframe feels good or not. Um, so show iframe, set show iframe, something just aired out for me. So let's see what that was. Use state is not defined. What you talking about? Oh, yeah, you're right, use state is not, why is it? Oh, I see. We just did the react use state. I actually hate that, uh, I'm, I'm lame that way. Let's do, oh, I don't have, nope. I, unfortunately, I have to do it. Um, that's fine. We will live with it. Okay. So we're going back here. We should be able to open our tab. We're making progress. Okay. So let's go component. Let's go log in. And it should shove an iframe down below. Oh, ha. Well, it's not going to do that if I don't tell it to. Set show iframe true. Let's see how many people can catch the bugs before I write them. Okay. Now, when we click the button, we say to show the iframe and we should show the iframe. Let's try this now. Oops, over here. Component, login. Hey, we've got an iframe. Now we could do this as like fixed positions. Uh, that could be a nice way to do it. Um, oh, interestingly enough, by the way, by default, a lot of websites do not allow themselves to run in an iframe because you don't want things like click jacking and other sort of like malicious uses of your website. So if, you use, if your website doesn't have a legitimate use case for running an iframe, usually people will just block it with X frame options headers or as well as content security policies, CSB headers. Now in our case, we actually do allow it, but it doesn't seem to be loading. So let's figure out why this is not loading. Maybe we just did the wrong URL. Uh, it's probably fine. Let's, let's inspect this. Luckily, because this is still browser based, we can use the browser dev tools, which at least, you know, I am familiar with. Localhost, CLI auth. Oh, we're making, missing HTTP. Aha! We need that because an iframe without HTTP um, opening a website. Oh, wait a second. Is that why window.open didn't work? There's a small chance it's why window.open didn't work. Um, let's test this really quickly, just in case. We'll do iframe test really quickly first because it should work now. Uh, there we go. What the heck? It's just a white screen. I wonder why. Seems to be loading our React app. Let's double check this page. Opens what we want it to. Ah, it'll need you to log in first. That's fine. Um, that should already be handled. But for some reason, we're still not loading. We loaded our little help widget. That's fine. And just make the slash check and you don't need to specify the HP. Oh, that's true. Andre's right. You can just use protocol relative slash s. Now in this case, oh, I don't know actually. Um, so in this case, I need HTTP because I'm serving from my, my local here. Um, that said, um, UI via post message. It appears you can open window from plugin UI via post message, maybe? Yeah, Adam, tell me, tell me what you're, what you're seeing. 
Um, I do also want to do a, um, a quick test and let's do window.open. Technically we could just do open, but I kind of like making clear we're, we're working off global variable window and we are going to, now that we have a function for this, it's gonna be a little easier. And, oh, I realized, did I do something wrong previously? Oh, whatever, blank, cool. Let's try this again. Hot reload, excuse me. Okay, login. Oh my goodness, it worked the whole time. This is definitely what developing is like, never makes sense. <laughs> or like, this is why um, silent errors are the worst type of errors. If something ain't gonna work, if you write code that other people call and you decide when something ain't gonna work, you're just gonna make it silently not work, you are hurting people. <laughs> now, I understand this happens definitely with Builder. Our APIs and error messages are not perfect either. Turns out the way we were going about this maybe would have worked the whole dang time. We just did not have HTTP. I guess that's maybe was all the whole time. Um, oh my goodness. This is a major relief. Oh, actually, hold on though. I do believe the doc said we will not get an opener reference. So we need opener to be able to have um, our uh, auth page write back, write a key back that we're gonna store. So there's still maybe a, a problema. So let's see, um, I'm going to console log opener, opener, perfect, beautiful, okay. Everybody pray for me that we get an opener reference. If we don't, then we may, all oh, that celebration may have been for nothing. Everybody pray, okay. What do we get? Opener is null. Okay, <laughs> it ain't gonna work, but that's okay. So now we're gonna have to do the polling technique. So this is interesting. So let's see how much time I have. Okay, I've got a bit of time here. So what we're going to need to do, it seems like this is what Caleb does and, and successfully and basically what Figma suggests. Let's go back to our trusty Excaladra. I got builder open like 10 times here. I really don't need that. Let's go to Excaladra. Let's talk about exactly. Don't celebrate too early. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, rule of life in programming. If you think something's working, don't get too excited because it's probably not actually going to work. Okay. So what we're going to need to do is from our Figma plugin, we're going to generate, right, let's just generate a UUID. So it's a good way to give us just a, a pseudo random ID that should be universally unique. We don't have a billion users per second authenticating. So it, uh, UUID v4 should be nice and safe. Um, so we're gonna generate a UUID. We're gonna send that to the builder app. Uh, let's make this green and a prettier green. Okay, we're gonna send that to the builder app. Oops, builder app. Builder.io, so we know what the heck we're talking about. Builder.io app. So we're gonna send that token this away. So we'll call that ABC123. And we'll put it here so we know. And what we're gonna do is then we're going to write that to an API. And so we're going to say, okay, we're gonna capture that the user accepted the, you know, I do want to authenticate. That, that's um, you know, I approve. And then we're going to send that, um, at really from the front end, that's all we need to send. We're going to send that over here to our API. Um, so this is actually, I'll try and be consistent here. This is the Figma plugin. This is the builder.io app, and this is the approve screen, you know, click the button and then we're going to go to our API. And in the API, it's at least good to know that other people do this. So we're not overcomplicating this. That's always a good thing to check yourself, by the way, in my opinion. When you start going down a complicated path, double check that that's the right one. This is a good time to pull in somebody else and be like, hey, somebody, can you pair with me for a moment or rubber duck with me? 
I think I have to go down this complicated path. I tried the symbol path, but it turns out the complicated one may be the only viable option for me. That's a really good time. I, I personally, I know this is against all the advice out there in the world, I feel like. I don't love pair programming. I don't like someone breathing down my, my shoulder while I'm coding. Even though right now, I guess I'm live pro pair programming. I have a bunch of you doing that and, and sharing advice. So I don't know. Maybe I'm being contradictory here. It's very possible. But the, the traditional sense of grabbing your coworker and ask them to get off of what they're doing, I think that's the problem. Here, when we're live streaming, it's like, hey, if you want to join, you can. If you want to leave, you can leave anytime. Um, if I'm going up to you at work and saying, hey, will you pair with me? I'm pulling you away from something else that I don't know if that's more valuable than what I'm doing or not. It probably is. So who knows? Um, so, but this is the one place I definitely advocate for it. I'm about to go down a complicated path. Have somebody double check. Here's your assumptions. Here's what you tried. And if really you can together, you cannot get any of the easy paths working, then they could confirm. Yeah, that's probably the simplest approach here. And when you do that, just as a piece of advice, try to be as honest as possible. I've seen some cases where person A thinks they had to do something complicated. And when they tell somebody else, because maybe somebody asked, you know, like, hey, that sounds complicated, maybe check with somebody more senior. And they basically, instead of sharing what the minimum needs are, they basically share what they think the complicated needs are. And the senior, more senior developer says, well, if that's the full complicated situation, then that's probably what you need to do. The reality is they didn't share the original context, the original need, the simpler need. And that's where sometimes things go awry. I've had that happen to me too. Somebody like, hey, I have to do this complicated thing. Does this make sense? And I'm like, I mean, I guess. And the reality is, no, they had to do a simple thing. They found one approach that would work, which was very complicated. And so, of course, I said, sure, I, I guess. And the reality is they didn't share the simple. What was the simple need? And sometimes people overestimate what that simple need is. Sometimes the simple need is simpler than you think. In my case, you know, you might say the simple need is I need an authentication flow. That's not true. The really simple need is I need from a Figma plugin to allow a user to confirm from a logged in, you know, browser that they want to you know authenticate to this plugin and i just need to get a key back simple not an elaborate author i just need a key so anyway back to this from the figma plugin we're going to generate this id abc123 we're going to pass it to the builder app once approved we're going to pass it to the api uh so this will be a back end this will be in a database built by api um we'll probably save this in google cloud firestore that's what we prefer to use um, Google Cloud Firestore, by the way, it's real time. It's super cheap. It's super efficient. It's not advanced in terms of querying. It's a NoSQL database. It's comparable like Dyna DynamoDB, though I, from what I understand, it's more flexible in querying um, some of the, the query operators you can use. Um, and most importantly, it's infinitely scalable. So Firestore will never go down. There's never a case where you hit the, the CPU limit or whatever. There is no server. It's a serverless database. At Builder, by default, we use serverless databases for everything. Google Cloud Firestore for everything by default. Uh, Google Cloud BigQuery for very, very large data payloads and, and processing work and very advanced SQL querying. And then Redis for caching. And that handles the vast majority of our data workflows. We get very spiky traffic. And we've definitely found um, that if you work in e-commerce, Black Friday, this and that, I would much rather not be on MongoDB personally. I'd much rather not be on Postgres. Anything that was built around this concept of a hot server, a server that's got your data and memory and some in files that has a threshold of how much CPU it can handle, connections it can handle. You, we have a serverless backend. Uh, I can architect this sometime if you're interested, where our serverless functions will spawn rapidly. And that's great until all those, each of those functions makes a connection mm -hmm. to your database. And surprisingly, database connections are shockingly expensive. On MongoDB, you can hose the CPU by having too many uh, connections shockingly fast. We had to migrate almost entirely off MongoDB and make sure everything's serverless. And now we have a true end-to-end -end serverless stack, meaning you could just slam our APIs like crazy in the vast majority of cases. And everything will scale up and scale back down. So costs are minimal in terms of they will always be kind of the lowest we need in terms of utilization. We're not over provisioning anything. We're not sitting with big servers that are hardly used just in case. Um, my last job, we had to do that. We had to have big servers that were way over allocated just in case we get a spike in traffic to just bump up there. So we're paying for all this, renting all these CPUs and we weren't even using those at the time. With serverless, we all know the benefit is you only pay for what you use, but if you get a huge spike, this is something people don't talk about a lot with serverless, that's a huge issue if your uh, functions or your front end is serverless, 
but your database is not, or some other key component is not, then as your front end or your cloud functions, or your Lambda functions rapidly scale, they can put all this pressure on your beta database and you get what some people call the thundering herd problem, which is as those functions increase, now they're all trying to connect to the database and they're all potentially querying the database. The database now is at 100% CPU and it's just frozen. It's not erroring. It's not saying, oh, I can't handle this request. It's creating this massive queue and it's trying to get through it, but it's at 100% CPU capacity. So then what happens? This is the big problem. What happens then is your functions are like, hey, I'm not getting a response. So instead of it finishing the request per function and moving on, you know, et cetera, it's spawning a ton more serverless function instances. And now you have this positive feedback loop where too many functions for the database causes the database to be stuck, which causes more functions to spawn, which means the database can never get unstuck. It's getting more stuck over time. And you then get this cascading issue where hopefully you have max instances set, meaning there's a cap on how many instances you um, of functions you can um, allocate before your um, your infrastructure provider starts just kind of 503 I think 503 is the, the status code sense saying hey unavailable 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 um, that's where you know the way past like long time ago we literally had to do crazy stuff like just shut down the database we had like long multi-hour outages because the database can never get healthy and one annoying thing about MongoDB that others might not have the same CPU resources that power the database and database queries is the same CPU resources that is used to upgrade the database. So what that means is when your database is at 100% CPU and you're like, oh, we need more CPU, let's upgrade. Cause you know, we're on a cloud hosted database service. Let's just tell it to click a button to say, use the larger size. Well, what it's gonna do, which we learned the hard way, is it's gonna be like, okay, upgrading. And an hour later, it's gonna still say upgrading because it has no spare CPU to actually manage executing the upgrade. And what a disaster. Um, biggest, most anxiety ridden times of my life was dealing with these thundering herd problems and the database unable to upgrade. And interesting though, spoiler alert, even if you upgrade the database, you've created such a problem of a backlog of uh, Lambda functions that have spawned, you probably will flood the new larger size anyway. So it wouldn't have necessarily helped. The answer we landed on is serverless everything. <laughs> and my goodness, it works. There are some times where you have to account for less flexible querying, but one thing you can do is you can have all your data in Firestore by default and keep a copy in BigQuery. The advanced, really advanced SQL can run on BigQuery and the simple queries can run off Firestore. Um, you could do similar with AWS. I will say DynamoDB is great as well and has some advantages, some, some drawbacks too. Firestore is very easy to add real time. Everything builder is real time like Figma, Google Docs, etc. Um, but, um, yeah, AWS has some advantages. They, they don't have the real time. Uh, from what I understand, DynamoDB doesn't have quite as flexible querying. Um, there's one other draw and also Redshift is way slower than BigQuery. Oh my goodness. And that's why you can use Snowflake to, to add the parallelization. Maybe some of this has been solved. Anyway, um, anyway, sorry, long rant about databases and our experience with scaling and scaling databases. Cause I feel like, you know, I'll mention to people like, oh, we use Google at Firestore and people are like, oh, that's not a, that's not a proper database. You gotta use Postgres cause blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, my man, my woman, my person, I don't know if you've had to deal with serious scale before, especially as a young company where you don't just throw money at scale. You don't do what Shopify does where you just have a bajillion Ruby on Rails and a bajillion, you know, Postgres instances. If you want to be lean and mean and fast and light, a serverless database, even if it's not the conventional approach, can be phenomenal and it can let you sleep at night beautifully and you don't have to worry about staying up all night or, or pages in the middle of the night because the database is at CPU. As the moment you don't have a single part of your stack where you have to monitor CPU traffic, um, bandwidth, anything that has some kind of cap connections, you are in such a better place. And I remember when I was talking to, you know, vendors about how do we solve this? They're like, oh, you had a connection pool, you add layer, layer, layer. It's like, mm, mm, mm serverless all the way. And I remember it was a very controversial choice. When I originally told our engineering team, uh, you know, maybe three quarters said, that sounds fine. There's a, a small minority of like, that sounds like a crazy, crazy idea. This, this is gonna be wild. This is gonna have all kinds of repercussions. 
And the reality was for us, at least every business is different. So please keep that in mind. I'm sharing our experiences. It was just our experience. It's not necessarily the right fit for everybody all the time. Um, Oh, I've never slept better. <laughs> I swear. We have we've page just stopped, out just stopped. It was just the weight of the world lifted off his shoulders. Incredible. So anyway, sorry, we're finishing a diagram here. Come on, everybody stay focused. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass a key to the API and we're gonna store that key in a database. So that's where we're gonna go, like Google Cloud um, storage, uh, Google Cloud Firestore is what I like. And so we'll drop that in here and um Ooh, good question there. Meaningful downsides to serverless. I do have comments on that. Downside vendor lock. Yes, Andre is correct, actually. Let me let me get back to that in a second. Andre is very correct. In fact, I'll tell you a specific downside we're running into right now that we're trying to figure out how to solve. Um, so what we're going to do, yeah, we're going to save this into a database. So this is going to be Firestore. And we're going to save the key in there. Uh, oops, following my color scheme, this should be green. This should be green. Okay, cool. And now the Figma plugin is going to pull the API, which is going to, it's going to ask, it's basically going to ask, hey, do we have a key yet for this ID ABC123? Please tell me. And then that is going to check the database. Uh, I guess we already have a line there for, hey, do we got ABC123? If we do get something back, we're going to send it back. And then we're, oops, we're then going to send it back. Now, this is way more complicated than I was hoping for, but I do think this is the answer. And it won't be that bad. And why don't we challenge ourselves? I'm going to rant for databases for another minute because there's a couple questions here. I have a meeting at 2.30 p.m. For me, uh, West Coast uh, U.S. time, it's 1.50 p.m. Um, let's see if we can implement this in that time window. I'll, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Um, it might be kind of cool and interesting. So here we go. So yeah, basically we're gonna create an ID. We're going to, if we get a token, we're gonna save the database under that ID. And we're gonna pull for that ID. And if we get the token, we're good. Um, we can save this for later. We might wanna refer back to it. A couple questions came in though. Are there any meaningful downsides to serverless? Yeah, so Andre pointed out the big one and, and it doesn't seem like an issue until it is, but I, I would say one really important thing is, you know, worry about issues when you hit issues. So. What I mean by that is don't try and architect a perfect system. There is no perfect system. There's just the right system for you today. And then if that needs to change in the future, that's normal. There's no way you're gonna predict the future. If you try and predict the future, you're gonna end up overbuilding and you're gonna start with the wrong system today and the wrong system tomorrow, even as your needs change. So yeah, the problem with serverless can be vendor lock-in. Every vendor has a different way of doing serverless. There's no idea of like Docker containers or, or Kubernetes or more specifically Docker containers for serverless. What I mean by that is, um, Here's the challenge we have right now. Um, you know, we are powered by Google Cloud Functions and Google Cloud's databases. Google Cloud for serverless function, Google Cloud databases. We also use AWS CloudFront. It's the cheapest CDN by far, and it's very scriptable, which is nice. Um, uh, oh, yeah, Andre brought up another good downside. I'll, I'll get to that one. I do have a comment on that, too. But um, so... The problem here is we, uh, as a as a company, Builder.io, has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger customers. Like we're we're in the situation now where we're actively talking to like multiple of the top five largest companies in the world interested in adopting our products. The problem, though, those really, 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 really big companies, they, in almost every case, cannot use a SaaS product, meaning. The only way they can use builder.io, whether it's our CMS, whether it's our AI, visual copilot, designed to code, or designed to publish live pages, et cetera, they cannot use it on our SaaS. Take, take an example of, um, I can't name any specific companies because I would get in trouble, but just think of the large, largest companies. They've got secrets. They have products they're going to launch. And you know if a product that, say, a really big computer company named after a fruit <laughs> is is let's say they're designing the page for the new something, something, something products that they haven't announced anybody yet in Builder. And one of our employees sees and they go, uh oh, this company everybody knows and loves is about to launch a car or something. And if they go and share that, that's gonna be a huge damage to that company. And so that company will not allow any of their essential data to be stored anywhere besides their own premises. So what that means for Builder is they're only going to use Builder if they can run it on-prem, meaning they can download a copy of the software and run it on their servers. 
that is really awesome if we were built in a completely agnostic way, a very traditional, you know, you've got a Docker container that's got your, you know, front end website or whatever, whatever. We're completely serverless. It's phenomenal for a SaaS product. But as soon as gigantic companies A, B, and C want to run it on their systems, then we're like, hey, could you run it on Google Cloud? And I will tell you, at least one of the companies, there's no chance because they compete with Google Cloud. <laughs> and so I even made a fool of myself and in a meeting with this company said, would you be able to use Google Cloud? And I caught myself and I was like, wait a second. Sorry, I know the answer. There's no chance. And they were actually kind of irritated with me. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry. I wasn't thinking. Got it. No Google Cloud. So that means we, we currently have a vendor lock-in and we need to abstract that out and we need to make some decisions. Do we just allow the whole system to run in one or a couple Docker containers? That's great, but we lose all the serverless benefits. How do we abstract our code to allow the ideal way for SaaS and then the on-premise way for the on-prem customers? That's something we're actually figuring out right now. We have some ideas, but it's something to be, to be navigated. Um, the other downside, and this is one that I personally wouldn't encourage people to be afraid of. It, it really is a benefit as well. It's the biggest benefit as well is serverless can infinite scale. Um, so, um, a traditional server, if you're past its capacity, it'll just go down. And so the problem with, um, that is, you know, there, there used to be this thing, uh, called like the Reddit kiss of death. If you, or hacker news, if you were top article on Hacker News or Reddit or something, you get tons of traffic and your website would go down. <laughs> that was, you know, old internet stuff. Now with CDNs, that's less of an issue. Uh, the CDN can hold a cache. You can set cache parameters so that even if your website's down, it's still actually, like the server might be down, it's serving from cache until the, the, the server is alive. So there's a lot of solutions for this. Um, but, um, oh yeah, uh, just a quick question that came up, send this to, to live YouTube. Yes, this, this is on YouTube and this will remain on YouTube um, for forever. Uh, it'll, it'll be there. You can rewatch it later. Um, but anyway, with CDNs now, CDNs will protect you from those, um, those crazy traffic surges that would lead to downtime. Um, but it still is true that there can be edge cases. I'll take one example. I think um, somebody on Twitter was complaining about Vercel in that they had some process go rogue and like spawn a bajillion like serverless functions. It was like kind of a, a self-feeding loop that was just infinite spawning. And uh, instead of Vercel having some type of built-in solution to detect and um, you know stop that before it got carried away, they just sent a huge bill to them. Now it sounds like Vercel already has guards in place and this was just an edge case they hadn't had yet and they've, they've since patched, but stuff like that can happen. Now in my experience um, with uh, building products, serverless, uh, that being an issue with serverless is really, it, it's never been an issue for me. It, in, in the broad sense, I think it's, it's largely a non-issue, but there is the edge case where it can bite you. Now there are some solutions to it. One solution, very simple, is um, with Google Cloud serverless functions, you can set a max instances. And I think they have a max instances by default. What that means is it won't actually upscale infinitely. It'll upscale up to like 100 instances, something like that. In fact, most serverless providers in my experience have caps. So they will warn you, they'll send you an email. Hey, you, you just shot up in instances, you know, um, are you sure that's what you want? And they'll, they'll probably have, so soft caps where they notify you, Hey, we're seeing something unusual. You should be aware. And they probably have hard caps for if you hit a crazy high, so it won't be infinite. It'll be something high. It'll just start blocking. Now that could get annoying because sometimes you're actually just a startup that's growing fast and suddenly they're blocking and whatever you get paged, you wake up, you, you fix the thing or message them and you, you get the, the limit lifted. Um, most of the time you have email alerts while you're getting closer. So that doesn't happen. You, you, you catch it before it's a problem. Um, but there can be edge cases where you don't, you don't have those things. In my experience, that never happens. And most of these vendors, I think know that they're not going to let you have an infinite bill. And even I had one case where I think it was, I can't remember, it might've been Datadog. We, we, we configured something wrong where we sent like an insane amount of logs to Datadog and we had this huge bill and we were like, oh, that wasn't intentional. And they just forgave us. They're just like, oh, here's how to fix it. We, we won't charge you for all that. You know, this one's on us and, and that worked out. So it's, I've never been bit by the, the risk of infinite scale, but it is something to be aware of. Um, the vendor lock-in is the real one, but I would say for most companies, most of the time, vendor lock-in is not the end of the world. And if we just wanted to switch from like GCP to AWS, Google Cloud to Amazon, web services, um, we'd go from Firestore to Dynamo and we would go from um, BigQuery to probably Redis, uh, sorry, Redshift plus maybe Snowflake. Um, so there's there's analogs, you know, you switch from one product to a comparable one. Uh, most people most people don't have to create software that can be run on any premise. So it's an unusual use case and 
we put it off for a long time until we saw how much money we'd lose, like how much money we can make by offering these services, to these huge companies. And we decided, okay, we'll, we'll do it. You have no way to rebuild chunks of the stack and maintain it. Anyway, let's do, let's challenge ourselves and see if we can build this full API flow. So let me show you how in builders code base, we make a net new API. It's kind of cool. Um, oh yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm glad you all like the behind the scenes stuff. This is just how we build our business. This is, you know, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I am a beginner programmer every day because the stuff I was good at 10 years ago is no longer the tech I use today. So I'm brand new at it and we're, we're learning as we go. Um, so I hope I, I, I appreciate that's valuable. At least some of you that we're sharing are learning. So what are we going to do? So we already have, so we have the Figma plugin and we know we can generate, we can open up a new window um, in the builder app. So we got that working after an hour on the, on the stream, we got this little tiny bit of code working where we have a button that could open a window. Crazy. That takes that long. Obviously we got distracted on some rants, but sometimes that's how programming is. The next thing we're going to do, um, is we are going to create that API. So looking at this, the first thing I'm going to kind of ask myself is, okay, what does the API interface need to look like? I think it's really, um, well, let's do a couple things actually. So let's create this UUID. Um, there's a couple ways to do a UUID. One is you can import a library for this. Do we already have one? Import from, there's a, oh yeah, we do. Cool. Import v4. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna make a little function. Crunch create a unique ID. And that's just gonna return, oops, UUID v4. Um, I sometimes, this is a weird thing I like to do. I sometimes like to take the dashes out of UUIDs. One, because I don't even know why they're in there. They just are. Two, because when you see the dashes, you know this is UUID v4. Do I want people to know the um, the backgrounds? Like, I sometimes don't want it to be that obvious, the underlying technology powering what end users are seeing. Sometimes I like to obscure that a little bit. Is that really the the way for best security? Not necessarily, but it just makes me comfortable. Now, in this case, I'll just use it to ID before, but I like it's all in the logic, even though a simple wrapper function like this just wraps another one. Does that make sense? In a lot of cases, no. I like to do it because we're gonna be creating IDs throughout this. And if we wanna change the behavior, we can just do it. Um, yeah, exactly. Patrick saying, this is kind of what I've assumed. So I appreciate you confirming. The dashes to help you detect the UID version. That's true. It's like the the number before or after the second dash or something tells you the UID version. But in this case, we don't need to actually parse it out later. We, we understand that we're just, how we're creating the UID is, is irrelevant. We're gonna just use it as a unique ID. So we'll take the dashes out just for fun. Um, and we're gonna pass that in here. So I'm gonna create a new, I'll implement this, but we're gonna create a new, I'll just call it UUID. Uh, maybe we'll call it request ID, request ID. We can rename this later. That's the beauty of programming. Uh, something like that. Okay. Oh, what is UUID seven? How do we go from four to seven? UUID four versus seven. Uh, results in a much better DB performance compared to random prefix. What? Does this have support for V seven? The, uh, this goes up to be five. Um, yeah, request UUID is not a bad idea too. That would be more explicit though. An ID versus UUID is kind of, I'm gonna keep it one step more vague just in case, what if we don't use? One of the most annoying things when you're in a code base is when something is named one way, but it actually is something else. So let's say we name this request UUID and we change it later to be something else. We don't use exactly the UUID spec. Maybe we, we have a good reason to change it to, to like a database generated ID or something. Um, that's where it'd be really annoying if this was request UUID and then it's not. I, nothing drives new engineers crazy than having some UUID variable and finding out it's not UUID and like that causing them headaches later. So we'll try and avoid that. JS has a native random UUID? What are you talking about? I didn't know about this. Is that a thing? I'm not seeing it. Random UUID. Andre's saying there's a, a function for this. I'm not seeing it, but hey, tell me if I'm if I'm crazy and maybe I just uh, copy pasted wrong. But anyway, we're making our ID, we're adding it here. Uh, interestingly, we use camel case for everything, but for whatever reason, we use snake case here. So we're just gonna do it that way. Uh, yeah, exactly. Vidal, what Vidal's saying is kind of how I'm thinking about it. ID is like the interface. It's just, all you need to know is this is an identifier, nothing else. Your UID is like the implementation detail. That's kind of why the, the reason for the naming. Naming's hard. I try not to overthink names. I try not to do silly names too. It's uh, it's always difficult balance in my experience. 
Okay, so we're not gonna get an opener, but we are gonna send this. Okay, let's test this really quickly. So no opener, we're just gonna set and forget. And we probably wanna set some type of loading state or something too. Um, we'll do that in a moment, but when we open this, actually, let's just do that. Const uh, loading, set loading equals react.use state, state false. Um, oh, interesting. Crypto.random. Is crypto a global variable? Let's see. Oh, what? What browser support does that have? Apparently there is a UUID function built into the browser. Crypto, I forget. Can I use crypto? Let's see if we can use this. It doesn't really matter. I already have the UUID library being imported. Look, like this is gonna work everywhere. I mean, we don't really worry about IE. I'm gonna stick to V4 just because it's there, but wow, that's really useful. Um, that's okay, Andre, I, I appreciate it. Cool, so for anybody who didn't know, you don't need a library for UUIDs. So you can just do crypto.random UUID in JavaScript. I really appreciate that tip, that's a good one. That's one I should probably share. I'll share that on Twitter or something later. Um, okay, so, okay, we talked a lot about how we're gonna add this ID. Let's actually process it. So I'm just gonna test this really quickly. Going over here, login. We should see request ID, cool. Big all ugly thing, it's a UUID without dashes, great. Now we need to change this flow. So the main thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over to, I'm gonna go into fast mode right now because I have a meeting in 24 minutes and, and it'll be really cool if we got this done. Adam would definitely value it. Um, we're gonna go in here and when we accept, we're gonna have somewhere in here we're gonna want, actually we're gonna grab this first. So um, request ID equals request ID. Let me know if I got any of this stuff wrong. I already have a typo. Request request ID, cool. And so now what we're gonna want to do is we're gonna want to save this. So it's kind of like if. Okay, so here's by default we do an auth return URL. In this case we don't want to return URL. Oh, that's right. I, I know that's a typical thing of auth flow is like OAuth. But in this case we're gonna say if we have a request ID, we're gonna save to the database else this. And in fact what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna await fetch. And I'm gonna figure out, so const um, URL to save the, the private key, there we go. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna fill that in later. So I'm gonna await um, URL to save the private key. Um, here uh, equals wait if res okay, we're good. Otherwise we'll handle the error later. Um, and then if we're okay, we're actually going to window.close. So the idea is we're gonna launch this. You're gonna say okay, and we're gonna close it. Like if you've done like the Google OAuth flow or stuff like that, we're, we're kind of creating a, a similar but slightly different flow. It's inspired by that same type of workflow though. Um, okay, so that looks good. So now we need this API. So this is, we're gonna, we're gonna go into beast mode here. We're gonna go API. So this is how, um, uh, our APIs are interesting. They're all serverless, but it's all from one repo. It originally started with a Firebase Functions repo. Now we use Google Cloud Functions, and we're moving to Google Cloud Run. But the workflow is still very, very similar, which is pretty cool. There's some downsides to this, but the DX is quite nice. So I can just go in here, source, entry point, and I just need to give my API a name. So this is this is the hardest part. This is going to take me 25 minutes just to think of a name. So this is like save auth. Oof. What do we want to call this thing? Uh, actually, we want to do the read and write through one API, right? So we'll call this auth token, Figma auth token. Yeah, that's preview. The use case right now is purely Figma. I don't want to think about this as a general auth solution just for the Figma plugin. Auth. I'm just going to call it Figma plugin auth. Cool. And um, I made this KV API the other day. So we're going to start with this. Uh, so here's some boilerplate. I know this is annoying. Uh, Hassan. Um, uh, what is the last name? Magari? He had the best, oh my God, hold on, Twitter. Let's find Hassan. Hassan had the best video ever um, on Twitter one time. Uh, Nutlope is his name, or is his like, Twitter username, um, which was something about all the tutorials online are like, okay, we're gonna do this, do this, then we're just gonna paste all this and then we're done. And then like, ta-da, we built Figma. It was hilarious. I'm kind of doing that to you now, but let me let me delete some stuff and I'll, I'll show you what I'm doing. I just wanted to remind myself in the laziest possible way. Um, so we're using Express here. 
and okay cool so this is and yeah this will be handy not found cool and so okay so what are we doing we are using the firebase functions now funny enough we actually don't even use firebase function anymore but we can also define our functions this way it's just a, kind of a cool little quirk here um, but basically we're defining a simple we're creating an express server I have a cores cross origin request um, middleware. We have a request logger, and I'm also going to use an app.use Firebase auth. Yeah, actually, uh, app.use validate auth. What is it? Verify user auth. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, these are a couple of middlewares. Um, this checks that we are um, the user is authenticated and this validates and rejects the request if they're not. So this gathers the authentication info. This rejects if they are not authenticated because we want the writing to this to require authentication. So the Firebase auth token, I'm going to send that to the API and only if we have that auth token will we forward that into our database. Um, our database we'll use in a second. The collection will call it Figma plugin auth tokens. It's a little verbose for collection name, but so be it. Not found. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, and something we're gonna need to do internal. Let's call this an internal API. Let's call this um, Figma plugin auth, and we have our ID. So the first we're gonna worry about is the get. We're gonna add a put in a minute, and we'll change these. Uh, Okay, now um, I'm gonna save this little not found function, a little reusable way to just send a 404 and that is easy to, to read and deal with. And we don't need to actually always verify the user auth. So when writing the put, we're gonna actually add the verify user auth middleware. This means here this will run and you can only put if you have user auth. I don't know if we need delete just yet. Let's implement our git. So all we're gonna do, there we go. Copilot answered for us, this is beautiful. So all we're gonna do is check, so this is our Firestore database. It's just something we can import, nice and easy to use. Collection, here's our collection name. Uh, maybe I'll be fancy and call this collection name, or let's be even better and call it um, Figma auth token collection. Very simple. Uh, it's very important to me that when we're writing code in our code base, it's as simple as possible. Now, it doesn't always mean we're on the latest, greatest of everything because, you know, we write code and we're not always trying to update versions all the time. It's been all the time on that. But I think you're seeing this is pretty easy to add new APIs in this code base. I'm going to rename this to um, Figma plugin, plugin auth. And there's one other piece we need to do. We go to firebase.json and uh, let's go to one of our internal examples. Here we go. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm just going to say uh, Figma plugin auth points to the function Figma plugin auth. Easy. So that's actually how we're going to wire up this to an external HTTP endpoint. Um, there's another little thing we'll have to do in a moment. Okay. So one other thing we want to do here for the get is we want to set cache header response to zero. We want no caching on this. That's pretty important. Now let me make sure, okay, cache seconds allow stale. Yeah, I don't want any stale cache either. Um, it'll be automatically false, that's good. Stale cache seconds, uh, there we go. Yeah, I think this is correct. So set cache header zero, that's just a function we use all over the place, easy way to set these cache headers. We use stale or validate, stale if error, blah, blah, but the zero says don't cache anything. We could have similarly said res.set header or set cache control no cache, but I like to reuse our functions. And again, you'll see I'm reusing, uh, not a lot, of course, middleware, there's packages for this, we have our own. You can even go into this. This is just literally allowing all the things. Uh, everything we do is like meant to be cross-domain, these APIs. Um, database is just creating the instance of Firebase database, uh, or Firestore database. Anyway, nothing too crazy custom in here. And then, okay, so now that's how we can check for the retrieval. Basically, we're gonna check by the ID, that UUID, and we're just gonna send the full uh, payload back. And here, we're gonna take this put, and um, we're gonna say, there we go. Beautiful. So Copilot knew what I wanted. Super duper duper simple. I don't love this error message, but we can worry about that later. Um, and actually, I should return after this, if it fails. 
But yeah, we're basically finding the ID, we're finding the body. And as of right now, I love to make abstract APIs, AKA um, APIs where we don't have to have these really strict schemas. For now, like I want my API to be as simple and reusable as possible. Um, I don't wanna have an API that requires, like if I just wanna kind of change how I'm saving the data and how I'm retrieving it, I have to go back and update API code. I like to make APIs just thin layers over the database, read and write, and most importantly, just check for the security. It's really all about the security rules is all. And so I'm not gonna have the API have an opinion about what the we the data format is of what I'm saving and what I'm reading. Now that could be seen as an anti-pattern because the the a lot of people would argue the API should have very strict governance over what could go into the database and not. It should be protecting the database. But also these are this is a NoSQL database. It's a schemaless database. And I would just love it if anytime I want to change like the name of the key, I just have to update the front ends, the builder app and the Figma plugin. I don't have to update the API as well. So if one day I want to save some other information, I just start sending it and I just start reading it. I don't have to update this layer. I like to think of my APIs a lot like the Firestore database or a Superbase database or, or whatever, where it's just like dump data in, get data out, make sure it's secure, make sure you, you, you have the right access. Beyond that, we don't have to have more complicated logic. There are use cases to have more complicated logic in APIs, but for stuff like this, where the API is really just, as you can see, a conduit, a secure conduit to kind of like, I guess you could say broker information or just allow access to information, we don't need to make it more complicated. A lot of people would want to, a lot of people want to spec it out, tell me everything, and you're kind of replicating the same logic in three places. Let's keep it, I'd rather have it only in one place. In a lot of parts of the builder application, there's just the API and the app. And so we will just worry about, you know, making sure things are okay between the two. And in most cases, I just want all the logic in the app and the API just reads and writes and doesn't have more logic than it needs to have. Now that we have three pieces, I'd much rather that these two have to have the information. This one is just a pass through. So that's what I'm doing here. And I don't love this error. You really should say, do we have an ID or do we have a body and make clear you're missing ID or you're missing body. But we're running out of time. I got 13 minutes. So let's see if we can finish this up. So I've got my API. I have my API server. Um, okay, so we know our URL now. So I'm going to do uh, appstate.config.api root. There we go. I think that's a function. So this is in the builder app. We have this global app state object. It's kind of like a Redux store, but it's reactive. It uses mobx state tree. This is where we're going to get our API root. This basically allows us to switch between development mode and production mode using a little UI. So this will just use localhost when we want it, otherwise not. We're going to go API. Um, okay, so we're going to actually write this ourselves. So we want API internal. Um, what did we call it? Who remembers? Figma plugin auth ID, let's just copy paste. And the ID is request ID. Okay, so we're gonna do a fetch method. Um, we're gonna do a put, because we're basically writing to this ID or overriding if anything happens to be there. It, it shouldn't, but you know. Uh, content type application JSON, yes, it's correct. Body JSON stringify, there we go. So we've got a private key, that's what we're gonna save. We're gonna have the API key, we're gonna have the user ID. One other little quirk of builder APIs, the internal ones, is we also have to supply the API key as a query param. Um, that, is, that is the local user's API key. That just makes it really easy to have a consistent way that this middleware always works. It's always checking for a valid auth token that also matches the user identified from the public API key of that user. That may not make sense, it's okay, but that's just a quick explanation as to why we're adding. It's a little unconventional to have both a query param with data as well as a um, payload with additional data. It's kind of like you either put your data in the body payload or in the query params. This is just convention we use and it's, it's served us well. So uh, there we go. So this, what it's gonna do is this is going to, uh, so here in the web app, we're going to, um, Gen we're gonna get or generate a private key securely. Um, we're then gonna write that through the API to Firestore where we have the ID is actually this because that's how we're gonna look it up in the Figma plugin and the body contains a private key. Um, so now what we need to do, assuming that all works, oh, I had to do one other thing. When we create new APIs, we need to do uh, earthly update entry points. We use Earthly for some things. Um, as you saw, I was just kind of like adding files. Oops, I need to run Docker. 
let's run Docker real quick. As you saw, I was just kind of adding files, but I mentioned that they they kind of you add them almost as if you're developing a monolith, but you deploy them in a serverless kind of one-off way. Um, and so um, the reality of this is in order to provide that, we have this kind of interesting script using Earthly, or this kind of cool way to run uh, uh, have a consistent environment between your CI and locally kind of using Docker and then run a script that can kind of run right here and execute regardless of your environment, your development environment. So that updated some configuration for us so that now we can deploy this as a one-off function. It actually staged a couple files. So it added to a YAML file, which is used in our GitHub Actions where we can deploy this function from a GitHub Action. And um, it updated to import. Some of the stuff works via this big all set of imports. Anyway. Um, what feature? <laughs> we're creating an auth feature. So somebody just asked what feature. We're just trying to make a login button from our Figma plugin to authenticate that you're logged into Builder and we can save data securely connected to your accounts so that we can provide the way to configure our Figma import to turn Figma designs to code using custom components um, in a way that the configuration is reusable across your team. So you do it one time and it always works. So anyway, we're getting really, really close. I think we've built all the stuff we need and we can use Postman um, to test this out. So Postman's what I usually use. I know there's some other thing called something I forget um, that people use these days, but Postman's popular as well. So this is where we can test out, you know, using our API. We will do that in a moment if we have time. But the last piece we want to do is have this in our Figma plugin. So what we're going to do is we're going to do um, here, I'm going to go loading and um, <laughs> let's do loading. So we have a loading indicator. If we're loading, we're going to open that. We're going to say set loading true. Um, why is loading not working? Are we missing props in loading? What's wrong? Contents. I see. Content equals, I'm just going to say loading. <laughs> uh, wow. ZZZ says greetings from Turkey. It's 1.30 a.m. You should get some bed, ZZZ. Or get some sleep, I mean. Um, and Vinicius, Vinicius, sorry if I'm saying your name really poorly, um, is asking when this feature will launch. I'm hoping in the next month or two. I hope we do a big launch. Like, hey, Visual Copilot 1.0, we've got all these improvements. We have a few other cool things and just the custom components, I know it's so badly needed. Um, what is this content parameter? What in the world is loading? Why do you need a content? Checklist or undefined? What the heck is this? Wait, it can be undefined. Oh, what? Sorry. I think uh, a little TypeScript thing. If you say something is requires undefined as supposed to optional, you have to actually write equals undefined, which I don't want to do. So there we go. I like that better. Okay. Um, I know time's running out. we got seven minutes here. I, I hope I can at least add the code. So we're going to set loading and now we need to start our polling. That's gonna be the tricky part. So actually, this is the part I'm probably not gonna be able to finish in time, but this is where we're gonna poll. So what we're gonna do is we've created our ID. Ooh, we're gonna to need to keep track of this. Um, but basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, the last part is pretty easy. We've written all the code. We can launch you to the Builder web app. You can hit approve, we'll save a token. And then here, we're just gonna poll. We're just gonna poll, is a token there? Is a token there? We're gonna keep sending um, this ID as a param. And so actually what I should do is return. Let's do, let's do something here, URL and request ID. That's interesting. We could parse it back out of the URL, but let's not do that. Let's do this. Const request ID equals bam. Um, request ID. So here we're going to actually return the URL and the request ID. We're going to say const URL request ID equals get bam. We're going to put the URL here. Um, URL, let's do to string to be safe. Um, okay, so here's where we're going to say uh, const URL with uh, URL with private key equals um, and we're just going to do this will be on what is the host we want? Okay, uh, let's just say it's gonna be builder.io. I'll replace this to test my local host in a minute. And then what do we want? API internal uh, Figma, what do we call this thing? Um, 
Figma plugin auth. Figma plugin auth slash quest ID. Cool. And this is it. We've kind of done the whole thing. All we have to do here is fetch this on a loop. So we're going to do something like maybe while true or more likely we'll do like, a, you know, we'll request up to a hundred times or whatever it is. We'll make sure the user has proper time to respond to the prompts um, before it times out. But we're just going to continue to fetch this until we get a key. If we get a key, we're going to save it. You're going to be off. And now all of our actions. Now, when we have that key saved here, we can read and write to your organization, like your configuration, your settings, so that you can do what I talked about. Um, and then if it fails, we can say, oops, something went wrong. Try again. And that's it. We weren't able to test it, but we were able to put all the big pieces together. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to finish this up later today after my couple meetings. I get to meet with my, my homie Mishko. He's our CTO and, and created Angular and AngularJS and Quick and, and other cool stuff, Karma, a lot of open source cool stuff. So meeting with him here in a minute. Um, I need to check on my fiance. She was texting me something too. So I'll do that. I'll end here in like one second. Oh, what is she doing? I don't know. I will check on her in a minute. But thank you all for tuning in. Um, one thing I would love is your feedback. Was this helpful? Was this interesting? I mean, I thought, hey, I'm going to build something. I also want to stream today. Why don't I do the two together? Rather than me just share, you know, tips as if I'm in some ivory tower, as if like those tips are always the way to code. What if I actually showed the normal, just down and dirty work where we're going to fail, we're going to do things wrong, we're going to trial and error. Um, and we're going to, you know, just... I hope give you a sense of this is how I code. Um, this is how a lot of people code too. Not everybody, but the way people code, I think a lot of people think that like the way people code is they sit down, they know exactly how to code it and they write perfect code and then they're done. It's like, that doesn't work at all. This is literally just trial and error until we figured it out. I don't care how much experience you have. I think I have something like 15 years programming experience with, with JavaScript, HTML, CSS and all that. I still have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I have no idea until I do. And that's through trial and error. That's how, you know, evolution in biology works, right? Trial and error. Nobody knows what they're doing. And so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, Brian says, what's your advice for someone getting into it at 25? Honestly, my advice is the same as the theme of this stream, which is just start trying to build things and trial, trial and error your way through it. And don't overly judge yourself, don't overly criticize yourself. When things work, be happy, and when things don't work, find another way that does work. And you'll eventually, over time, figure out how to build stuff, and you'll never know how to do everything. You will always feel like you don't know how to do anything, and that's kind of the expectation you should have. Don't be hard on yourself, just create stuff. The more you create, the more you'll know how to do, and the more you'll feel confident, and the more people wanna hire you, because they wanna hire people who can build stuff. Um, so anyway, I'm going to have to wrap the stream here. Thank you all for joining. Um, the videos will be, uh, they will live on in perpetuity on YouTube, Twitter, or X, um, LinkedIn, and I'm pretty sure some, or Twitch as well. So feel free to catch it there. I'll try and do more streams. I don't have a stream schedule. I just jump on and do it when I can. And uh, thanks all for joining. I appreciate your comments. You can leave comments afterwards. I will see them. And I hope to catch you next time. And if you like this format, let me know and I can try to do